Hi guys, welcome to Investing with JYK and today we'll discuss in detail the uh, company uh, Guangshen Railroad Railway or whatever you call it. Uh, so this stuff is public in both uh, China, Asia, so you can see it's like 3.4 and the PB of 0.8 or you can buy it uh, through uh, Hong Kong it's public as uh, traded in Hong Kong as well with a PB of 0 0.6 and um, you can also buy it with uh, GSH which is the same thing as Hong Kong so you get it at about 0 0.6 PB now uh, if you look at the price action it's been uh, more than double the current price not long ago just at the beginning of uh, last year and if you look further up you know you're getting this at well let's remove that you're getting this at uh, oh by the way what I did is I just excluded the effect of dividends right, so you're getting it at about the price of 2006 so not too bad not too bad or the price of 2009 and what made it more valuable now that I think uh, I'll explain that later but let's look at uh, first their financials so um, they are public in three places therefore they actually publish three different reports in Hong Kong you can see this is H share in Hong Kong, they um, they have a uh, two reports per year. In U.S., uh, similarly, because it's actually a reflect it's it's a ADR for the Hong Kong shares, and um, this is for 2016. I was just looking at it because I was trying to see if the their employee number increased. They actually went down. But that's not very important. So. Um, you can take a look at these yourself if you want, but essentially, let me just find matters of importance. Yeah. Essentially, their earning hasn't been doing too well. Ah, financial statements 104. Here we go. okay so let's first look at the revenue you can see revenue increased and um, for passengers so total revenue increased reasonably like four or five percent but cost increased quite a bit more so uh, the total operating expenses actually went up a lot more than that it's more like 10% almost a little bit more than 10% which meant that their profit actually declined by like 30% or 20 something percent so that's not good um, and the majority of the um, uh, cost increase came from two places you have the employee benefits and the equipment leases the equipment lease stuff is mostly a uh, artifact due to some uh, regulation changes um, so it the effect should be one time so this kind of increase uh, should not be there year over year but the employee benefits line um, this increase I think will sustain because labor cost in China is going up and even though uh, they have introduced well they have they are now employing fewer people and uh, while increasing their revenue so the revenue per employee goes up it doesn't seem to be enough to offset this cost pressure now this I think won't go on forever because um, the government does want to make money and then they uh, there's some initiative that um, is currently happening that may benefit us as shareholders 
I'll get into that later as well. Okay, so so that's just for one year. So let's look at it at a multi-year. So this is a website, Li Xingren, which I've introduced to you guys a few months ago. Very, very good stuff. So let's look at their um, ROE. So average ROE was as high as 7%. Is that good? No. Um, it's gone now down to like 2%. And uh, leverage ratio is 1.25 for low leverage. ROA is very low. Okay, so that's one thing. And uh, now let's look at their cash flow. So their cash flow is around on average. Let's go down here. Um, the median cash flow was something like 600 million uh, yuan. Okay, so 600 million yuan. Uh, CNY to HKD. I'm just going to convert everything later to... Actually, I'll convert everything to, uh, to CNY. So the market cap... The market cap of this guy is 200 billion that's uh, a 20 billion uh hong kong dollars so 20 hkd to cny is something like 17 billion so you're getting a free cash flow yield of 600 divided by 17170 a 3.5 percent free cash flow which is on par with your dividend if you look at it that's that so basically 3.5 percent is their uh is their median return for since for the past 10 years and okay so none of this is super exciting right 3.5 percent return not very good pe at the moment is like 22 if you look at this thing pe is about 22 and you can compute it yourself as well. But uh, margins under pressure, not because the top line stopped growing, but because the um, cost is going up and they don't have too much power to increase their um, increase their uh, pricing because uh, this is a regulated uh, business. Okay, so that's that. Now let's go to what this company actually is. So this company um, operates this green line from this Ping Shi place, following the green line down here, following this to Shenzhen and all the way to uh, Kowloon uh, in uh, Hong Kong. So that's the line they operate. Um, this line is actually operated by uh, MTR, I think. Uh, so their thing ends just down to Shenzhen. And they own the land, well, own as in they have the usage rights uh, because you can't own land in China. But it's more or less equivalent. Um, you do have to renew it some of their things some of their land usage rights are have is coming up for renewal uh between 2027 and some other date like 2040 or something but they own the land between guangzhou and shenzhen so all this track and all the stations uh, not including guangzhou but guangzhou east Dongguan, Changping, and uh, then there was another one here, and then another uh, one here, like uh, it's called Pinghu, and then Shenzhen. They own all the stations and all the tracks. They leased the um, tracks and the stations, the land for the tracks and the stations uh, from their parent company, 
uh, which owns 37% of them. So from Guangzhou all the way to Pingxi. They also do not own the station of Guangzhou. They do own the station of Guangzhou Dong. And that's one of the bullish thesis for this company. Um, okay. So what about their um, balance sheet then, right? So is this thing under stress? And so let's just take a look. This is their balance sheet. Um, you see this huge red thing that's fixed asset or PPE. And um, uh, this tiny little thing, uh, which is about 4%. This color, I don't even know what this color is in English. It's about 4% of that is uh, cash. And all this orange stuff uh, is um, receivables. And then the green thing, which you don't really care a tiny bit, is um, inventory. And yeah, so the company is mostly fixed asset and receivables. They do get enough cash flow to pay a consistent dividend so that's what you have here and on the other side of the balance sheet you got the debt situation so th before 2014 they have this huge thing here and you can see it in the balance sheet as well they do have a pretty big chunk of cash and that went away as the debt went away so they had this debt, the long-term debt, of half of their liabilities back then. So that's paid off. And now they no longer have any interest-bearing debt. Uh, this orange stuff is uh, payable. And uh, this pinkish stuff is, again, other payables. So basically they have some payables and no... Um, no interest bearing debt so they are they have negative uh, financial cost so their finance the the yeah the, the financial expenses is negative at the moment okay so the company's history is that they in like 1990s ish um, they really want to improve Guangzhou to Shenzhen, which is a namesake. Namesake is Guangxin Railroad, so Guangzhou to Shenzhen. They want to improve that thing. Guangzhou to Shenzhen was actually built uh, in 1911 or something by either the English or, or someone. Um, so they want to improve that, but they have no money. So the, the government basically was like, all right, you guys uh, can form a company. And uh, that was one of the first... Um, privatized railway uh, lines in China. Remember, China only started opening up after 87, and 90-something is when they uh, uh, went public. So they got the, some uh, capital by going, to, going public in Hong Kong and uh, in um, US, and then they got the capital to improve this railway. And once they improved that railway in 2004, I think, they, the parent company sold more shares, uh, well, the company itself, actually, sold more shares uh, to then buy the uh, operating rights for the line from Guangzhou to Pingxi. Um, so the, the parent company, uh, which is 100% owned by the China, the I think it's called the China Railway Corporation, uh, which is uh, the one that owns almost all the railways in China. So that now controls 37% of the company. So it's still a, I think still has like a, a veto rights or whatever uh, when it comes to major decisions. And um, there are some related party transactions between um, uh, Guangxin Railroad and then Guangzhou uh, Rail, it's called Guangdong Railway Corporation or something. Um, so yeah. Okay, so 
that's the history out of the way and how they got their assets and now is um, one thing that you might worry is like how much self-dealing is there between Guangdong Railway Corporation and Guangsheng Railway um, so it's not as much as you would think so this is their uh, is their A shares annual report so uh, we can see the related party transactions in page 114 page 114 page 114 okay so that's how much related party transaction there is and then um, I'm not gonna go through one, them one by one but essentially a lot of them is uh, full price in uh, full cost pricing and some of them like this one is uh, determined by the price set by CRC China Railway Corporation so by their big brother um, and this one is the most interesting I'm gonna go into that but essentially most of the others are just by uh, full cost pricing and full cost pricing includes a profit margin as well so it's very hard to determine whether that's fair um, and also if you look at this one it's a fair it's almost more it's more than 10% of their total cost so it's significant and this one also increased by quite a bit right um, okay so what about this thing what is this this is the lease agreement so I think that is a good indicator on how much self-dealing there is how much sucking blood is happening between uh, their parent company and uh, Guangsheng Railroad so it actually is somewhere here I think uh, 118 yeah so they had a, a contract between um, they had a contract between um, uh, themselves and and uh, uh, Guangzhou Railroad Corporation and then the contracts for lease of all the land usage rights um, and how and it's for at most 74 million yuan per year and last year they paid 58.5 million now it doesn't say in here how big uh, the piece of land is and nowhere in this annual report says that either but good thing is that we have the 20f and if you look at 20f they leased 28 million square meters from grgc i'm gonna call it grgc from now it's too long grgc is their parent company right so how much is that um you have 58 million in payment and 28 million uh, in area so it's about two uh, RMB per square meter and then what is the fair market price so I started checking on uh, essentially here uh, around this city which is like midway between Guangzhou and, and Pingxi obviously anywhere closer to Guangzhou you get higher prices because it's more desirable anywhere further away it's less so I picked somewhere in the middle and apparently if you look at uh, you know some land that's being leased out there it's, some say it's five yuan per month which is quite a bit more than what we're getting and uh, uh, this one I'm not sure if that's for the whole thing or what but this one has it marked out so per um, 
per uh, day per square meter you get seven cents so 0 0.07 times 365 looking for 25 yuan okay so that seems much higher than what we're getting so we're getting at two and I also looked it around here um, if you look at anything that is agricultural uh, it's usually less than one so this unit is 666.67 um, square meters so you get like 500 divided by 666 so 75 cents per square meters but that's agricultural if you do anything that is uh, industrial then you're looking at this pretty high number right so 100 yuan per um, 100 yuan per per year so conclusion i would say there's not some uh, very uh there's not no significant uh bloodletting by the parent company okay so now let's get to the actual bullish thesis why is this thing um why is why am i bullish on this thing so this company owns as i mentioned owns all the land between um between i'm um, let's just focus on the land that they own not the land that they leased between guangzhou and shenzhen everything along this way and their big stations are guangzhou east dongguan changping and uh pinghu and then shenzhen and then also this uh zhang tomu right so and also the track obviously so let's see how much these land are worth. So there is this, um, there was a, uh, let me see. I had it, I had it. There was a piece of news that came out. which I can no longer find, which is no less than what you expect from me because I always have trouble finding things. Damn it. Okay. Hmm. There was a thing called old um, goods. Oh yeah, here we go. Here we go. So this is where I'm thinking like something is starting to happen. So they own a bunch of land. Uh, in fact, they own 13 million square uh, me uh, square meters of land. And they sold this thing to the Guangzhou um, uh, Land Development Center. And then they got one point three billion yuan and the size at which they sold this thing uh, let's see I had the contract open but I can no longer find it but trust me you can find it later yourself by just by searching this number or or um, this um, the average selling price was 35,000 yuan per square meters and that was like holy crap that's a lot of money right if you ever obviously that's non-realistic but if you ever assign a 35,000 um, per square meter land price to all their land holdings you end up with some ridiculous number let's see how many billions 445 billion in just land value but obviously that's not the case so 
I started developing this model to see uh, exactly uh, how much land we can expect and now we're trying to estimate All right so first my assumption is that the thing that's going to be worth the most are the stations or the land around the stations because the track themselves may not necessarily be very valuable um, so we shouldn't value them the same so those are the stations between Guangzhou and Shenzhen and they do not own Guangzhou but they own everything here I checked um, on each of those uh, entries and uh, they are the they, they do own it uh, so Guangzhou Dong the size of that is this you can take a look this is the size and that's the whole thing so let's assume half of that is uh, usable commercial land uh, the other are basically tracks um, it's not to say the tracks are, are worthless because in Japan for example they would build underneath the tracks and then there will be commercial space there so all the major stations in Japan that I've been to have very good um, commercial establishments around it or underneath it or above it um, or you can even think about uh, where I'm, I'm living right next to Hongqiao at the moment and uh, you can look at Hongqiao station and within it um, I'm like on the so this is where you wait but yeah, this is the this is when you wait, but then underneath that, you have some like a huge uh, square of just food and all that everything. So um, can't really see it here, but I'll probably show you guys later once I um, it, when I go past it, but. In Japan, that's even more obvious. Uh, JR owns a lot of um, real estate near stations, and those are pretty well regarded real estates because that's where people uh, go through. So, I'm assuming this stuff, half of that, is buildable. The whole thing was um, the whole thing I checked was uh, forty-two thousand. Uh, square meters and then similarly for everything else and uh, you know this is Guangzhou and the next one is Dongguan looks like this the blue line there's a faint blue line if you can make it out these are what the stations land holding is and the actual usable part is obviously this whole um, red ish thing so let's say a third of that is usable and then I checked the uh, the price uh, for land around it and it turns out uh, it was something like so I, I did about a third of that the unit price turned out to be about 15,000 um, square meters uh, 15,000 uh, per square meter and I did the similar for the other stations and I estimated their building size so total just these stations are worth 2 billion yuan and then if you tack on the rest which is 13 million uh, actually let's just go through these stations they, they are somewhat interesting so Chashan is where Dongguan station is and you got this station which is Changping and then uh, that's some, that's in here and uh, yeah so that that whole uh, blue area is is the land holding of the station but I'm not including the whole thing I'm just including this part here oh yes this is the thing I was looking for damn it remember I was talking about the thing that I couldn't find uh, yeah this is it so they sold 37,000 um, square meter of land for 1.3 billion. 
Okay, this is quite crazy. So yeah, who knows what else, what other land holding they have? I couldn't find any data on it. I can only estimate uh, like what they have, and I have to put on some reasonable valuation on them. And I think this is a uh, underestimate because the stuff they sold near Guangdong East, not even the station itself, somewhere near the Guangdong East was just piece of land. They were able to fetch thirty five thousand. I'm guessing uh, the they have some other hidden land holdings that we are not aware of. But this piece of land was never mentioned in their previous annual reports until suddenly they're like, oh, we're going to sell it. And if you think about 1.3 billion, that's two years of their free cash flow. And the cost that was carried on the books was some ridiculous number, I think. Um, their total land holding let's just look at that that was yeah just thought of it the total land holding was tiny um, it should go to balance sheet balance sheet looking for balance sheet Cash flow here, balance sheet here. They had the total, yeah, they, they accounted for all their land usage rights and software or whatever usage rights at 1.9 billion, right? And then they sold one of them, a tiny portion of, it, of that, for 1.3 billion. Now, now you see the crazy undervaluation of essentially the intangibles it, it's this goes to intangibles in china it wouldn't it wouldn't in us but in in china it goes in, in uh, under intangibles and the fixed assets only includes the buildings not the land the buildings and the trains and the tracks the the actual physical track not the land they sit on so yeah so Per square meter, you're looking at, I don't know, uh, 10. I think if you divide this thing by 13 million, uh, you end up with, uh, let me just do it then. Can't do math in my head anymore. 145, 150 um, yuan per square meter, and that is crazy undervaluation because anywhere you see near, at least near the stations they are around more than 10,000 and if you look at here they you know near uh, Zhang Wutou um, they got some somewhere around um, uh, 9 point, 900 million 900 million Divided by the size, which is uh, 38842, 38842, 23,000. And this is the Zhang Moutou, uh, uh station. It's quite yeah, a lot of things going on around here. And then you got the Pinghu um, station. Pinghu station is quite small in terms of building so that's the only thing that I counted but according to what I read there will be this one basically talks about the um, urban renovation urban renewal I think is the proper word for Pinghu and then they're going to put like three more subway uh, lines on that station and who knows how much that thing is going to uh, explode and maybe they'll build something that's actually pleasant. Currently, the station is pretty run down and just boring. There's nothing commercial in it, which is a huge waste, I think. Okay, and then uh, last but not least, you got Shenzhen. And the Shenzhen station is obviously 
in the middle of Shenzhen and super built up. Uh, the size of it is um, just the building part part of it is where is that? Um, oh yeah, here you go. Twenty eight thousand square meters, just the building. And then the the and then I checked the the price for these commercial real estate land usage rights in Shenzhen and turns out to be pretty high as well. So those are the estimates and you can see none of them were nearly as high as the 1.3 billion that they somehow just came up with. Um, but the total is like 2 billion. And I think this is a, this is significantly undervaluing it. And then on top of it, you got the rest of the 13 million um, 13 million uh, uh, square meter of land that they still own and who knows let's just value them at 1000 um, or 2000 let's say 2000 per uh, square meter because you are talking about between the because these two cities, where are we? These two cities are the two that shines the brightest uh, in in night China. So if we look at night China um, satellite, maybe. There you go. You can make it out that that is well you had a huge thing here which is Jiangsu and and Shanghai and that's the, the other thing that I really like Ninghu Expressway uh, so that's around here and this is like connecting here and here so yeah uh, I don't think the land price is gonna be anywhere below 2000 so if we do that we end up with 26 billion on top of the 2 billion. So 26 billion is already higher than the market cap, which is at the moment is sitting at uh, 17 billion, um, 17 billion yuan. So you got a huge uh, hidden asset here. And how long this takes to real to be realized, I don't know. But um, couple of things are happening one is uh, this you may want to read it but essentially the Chinese government is now pushing for state-owned enterprises to be essentially less state-owned and to have private um, capital involved in the management of uh, what used to be state-owned enterprises so the couple of examples that uh, has happened or is about to happen is um, uh, Uni China Unicom and GRI. Both of the both were state owned, but uh, both are now going to be majority privately owned. The state owned part is only going to be like for GRI is going to be four percent, five percent, and for um, for the what do you call that thing uh, Unicom is I don't know how much but they involved uh, Tencent Alibaba and all these guys so yeah so once they I think once they go through with this uh, this reform this uh, state-owned enterprise reform then we might go the whole direction might be very similar to what JR so is going to be. So JR, uh, JR is Japan Rail. Uh, so if you look at, yeah, so this this is one of them. They have like four, four or something. Um, and they only make like thirty percent or something of their profit from actually taking people around, but they get the rest of their earnings from uh, leasing out real estate 
on their stations. And uh, their ROE is, so this is gonna be very similar to say, let's say a JR East. So near, uh, JR East is um, uh, Tokyo, it's basically. Right? This is comparable to Tokyo. Uh, you got the two cities with the highest GDP in China or two out of four with the highest GDP in China. So JR East ROE is return on FOT. Let's see. It's gonna approach, I'm guessing somewhere around less than 10, but more than five. We should approach that. Come on. JR East. Um, maybe I can see it on Seeking Alpha. Japan Rail. East Japan Railway Company. Yay. Key data. Oh my god, it's currently at zero point. Okay, bad on me, but in terms of um, something really weird going on here, I think the numbers are off. PE 0 0.212 and then what? That means your PB is like non-existent. I think this is wrong. Has to be wrong. Anyways, I will put the ROE uh, of JR, which I think is very much comparable on the uh, video notes and you guys can check it out. But uh, in summary, I think this Guangxian Railroad is a very good opportunity to buy and you've got probably a 3% return with no catalyst. But with a catalyst, um, you have land holdings that's worth quite a bit more than the market cap, zero debt, and a um, piece of railroad that's connecting two out of the four most uh, economically vibrant cities in China. Oh yeah, last thing, just to show you, cost of uh, buses to go between Guangzhou and Shenzhen is about 70 to 60 to 70 yuan takes two to three hours and if you look at um, railroad takes one hour and a half uh, similar price 70 if you do like normal seats 79 and this is a frequency look at this every six minutes 13 25 24 19 10 right so you got a huge amount of choice in between here yeah you got 30 minutes but then you got what an eight minutes so there are many 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 trains going between those two cities um so it's a very convenient choice. It's also fast, uh, but obviously there's, uh, oh yeah, there's one thing I forgot to mention. The, I think the reason why this went down so much was the fear of competition. If you look at the map I was showing you before, other than this green line, you have the red line. And if you, pay, if you see that the red line is that much straighter compared to the green line. And uh, the reason is the red line is a high speed rail, which goes at 350 kilometers an hour. Um, the uh, Guangxun Railroad only goes at 190 kilometers an hour. And the difference is that if you take the high speed rail going from Guangzhou Nan to Shenzhen Bay takes 35 minutes. And then the uh, Guangxun Railroad takes one hour and 35 minutes. The price is the same. Now. People were extremely worried that this would uh, take 
market share away from Guangsheng uh, Railroad, and I wouldn't worry too much because this part, I think, um, this part was connected in uh, 2018 in September. So the whole thing was completed by September and from Guangzhou Nan to Shenzhen, that part has been built since for like years. Right? So I wouldn't really worry about that, the competition. And then even with the last part connected, which means you can now go from Guangzhou directly to Shenzhen, uh, to, uh, to uh, Hong Kong um, without, without changes, the revenue still increased for uh, Guangxin Railroad in the last quarter of 2018, which is when the connection has been made, the high-speed connection has been made. So yeah, so that's not something I'm, I, I will, that would worry me. Um, just, just to illustrate like the whole situation in um, around the uh, Zhujiang Delta. This place is is amazing. This place has has so so much of China's GDP is in this delta, and then in this delta, where you got Shanghai and Hangzhou and uh, uh, Nanjing. Those two are like where everything's happening. Unfortunately, there's no railroad to buy in here. Although sooner or later there will be, well, probably this year there will be an IPO of the high-speed rail going from Beijing to Shanghai. It will be a great asset. The only question that I would ask would be what the price is, right? If you get it at a reasonable price, Shanghai to Beijing is bound to make money. This line, oh my God. It's always full. Every time I take it, the, the trains are almost always full. And there's so much demand between those two places. It's five hours, and if you take the plane, it's going to be close to five hours, to, to, uh, taking into account of uh, the uh, time to go to the airport and wait and all that stuff. All right. Um, yeah, that's it for today. Very long video. Hopefully, I haven't borne you to death. And... Uh, Bye.